Thank you very much, Dean Kamrava. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in Qatar. Very, very grateful to ICT Qatar for making this possible. Uh, this is only my second trip to the Gulf, and it's my first visit to Qatar, and I've been very impressed with what I've seen in the last 24 hours, and look forward to talking to more people tomorrow. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this first slide is actually the most important slide of the entire presentation. Um, if you ever do a Google search on Michael Nelson, you will discover that there are about 15,000 of us in America. Um, so if you want to find me, you need my email address, which is mnelson at pobox.com. Or if you think email is kind of 20th century and you're really a cool person who only uses Twitter, you can find me at Twitter at, at Mike Nelson. Uh, you, uh, you already heard my background. I have this very unusual career. I spent time in technology, spent time in government, spent time in business, and now I'm in academia. And I'm, I think I found the perfect spot for myself because I work in the communications culture and technology program, which tries to bring all those pieces together business, culture, technology. <clears throat> the one thing that wasn't mentioned in the introduction is that I, I had the chance to work with the Obama campaign on technology issues and was uh, a speaker for the campaign and helped develop some of our policy positions. <clears throat> so I also, in addition to doing policy and business, do a little bit of politics. Today I'm, gonna, I'm here in Qatar to visit the Georgetown campus to learn more about what's going on here in the Gulf and with new media, and to share some insights about the future of technology and its impact. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give you the short version of some of the classes that I teach. And so for free, you're going to get about $20,000 worth of classes from Georgetown. The, the, one of my classes is called What's Shaping the Internet? It's a overview of all the policy decisions, technology decisions, business decisions, standards decisions that are shaping what the internet's going to become and what we can use it for. My favorite class is called How to Predict the Futures. I don't try to teach students how to predict one future. <clears throat> That's not possible. Instead, we focus on looking at different scenarios of the future so they can be prepared for whatever comes. We look, at, we look at technology trends, we look at business trends, demographic trends, and we develop scenarios. And I also am presently teaching a class called eGovernment 2.0, how citizens' relationship to their government is going to change as we have social media like Twitter, like Facebook, uh, like YouTube. I'm going to focus on making this very short and concise because I want to have time for question and answer. In Washington, we often boil everything down to a few words. The right words can define the issue. The wrong words can kill a project. They can stir emotions. They can mobilize people. There's a wonderful book called Words That Work by Frank Lutz. Uh, he was the Republican pollster who worked for Newt Gingrich back in 1994 and helped Newt Gingrich and the Republicans developed the contract with America. And Frank Lutz is a specialist in words. Uh, he came up with the idea of calling the estate tax, which is the tax we have in the US that is uh, imposed on, on the estate of people who die. Rather than calling it the estate tax, they called it the death tax. Um, it usually only applied to very wealthy Republicans, so the Republicans were opposed to it. And they use that phrase very effectively to, uh, to implement legislation to reduce the death tax. Um, Obama's entire campaign boiled down to just two words when you really think about it. It was about change and it was about hope. It's also important when you're developing a new initiative that you have the right words. Uh, how many people remember the Strategic Defense Initiative? About three people. How many of you people remember Star Wars? Yeah, right. That's because Strategic Defense Initiative is way too long and it's very vague, whereas Star Wars really captured the project. So I'm going to give you some words today to think about the future of the Internet. I'm also going to give you some numbers. In Washington, it really helps to have lots of data. But what really matters is to have two good, memorable factoids, preferably true. <laughs> when I was growing up, 
I learned that nine out of 10 dentists recommend Crest toothpaste. It wasn't true, but it's still embedded in my head and I still use Crest toothpaste. So I'm gonna give you some factoids today as well as a few words. And I'm gonna give you some stories because in Washington, as anywhere else, stories matter. We've been telling stories since we were in the caves and that's how you really convey a concept. If you have a really good story, other people hear it and they start telling other people. And that's when you know you've really gotten the message across. So I'm gonna share some words and concepts about the future of computing, future of the internet, give you some numbers, give you some stories. And like any good professor, I'm gonna give you a reading assignment or two or three. So if you wanna read some more, you can have some place to go. So my first word, I have 11 words today. First word is people. This is the most important word because it is what defines how technology develops. When you look at the march of technology, at the front is always the hardware. And hardware is developing faster and faster. Every, every week or every month, there's a new hard drive, a faster network, a faster chip. Then we've got to build the software to use the hardware. Then the real challenge, getting people trained to use the technology and restructuring the organization that they're embedded in so they can take full advantage of it. That's the process. Technology often takes a few months. Getting people on board, that can take years. Restructuring organizations, that can take decades. But people are what really matters. And the problem is the technology is accelerating and people aren't learning that much faster than they used to. So we have this growing gap that programs like mine and some of the other schools here in, in Qatar are trying to close. And that is our biggest challenge. Second really important word is vision. And I hope today to give you a, bitter, a, a clearer vision about where this technology is going. I'm very fond of a Japanese proverb that says, vision without action is a daydream, but action without vision is a nightmare. It's also a very good way to waste lots of money and lots of time. So I want to give you a vision about what's coming and a vision you can explain to others in your organizations, other people you work with. This is the two minute vision of where we're going. And if you hear nothing else today, you can walk out after this, this, this slide. The point I want to make today is that we are entering the third phase in the development of the internet. And this phase is as profound and as revolutionary and as transformational as the World Wide Web was 10 or 15 years ago. And we're just defining this next phase now. Over the next two or three years, we're gonna make critical decisions about how the internet evolves and how it's used. And that will either open up new possibilities, almost unlimited possibilities, or it will narrow and limit what we can do. As we define this new phase of the internet, policy and regulation will be important, but standards and business practices will be more important. So what your organizations decide to buy, what you decide to do with this technology, what you demand of vendors and network providers is really gonna help shape this future. And the factoid that's most important to remember is we are still in early days. One way to think of the internet is as a unruly adolescent. I have a 12 year old daughter who is two months away from turning into a teenager. That's how you should think of the internet. Her whole future is ahead of her. She's still trying to define what she becomes in the future. And she has lots of different possibilities, but we don't know where she's gonna go. And the internet's like that, it's, a, it's an adolescent. It's, we're less than 15% of the way through this transformation that's enabled by the internet. The great thing about that factoid is I can prove it to you in at least five different ways. You can measure all the people in the world who use the internet. It's only about 15, maybe 20% who use it on a regular basis. You can measure the amount of bandwidth and look at how far that's gonna grow. Look at the amount of content, the amount of devices, the number of applications. There's gonna be a factor of 10, 20, even 50 increase in all these areas. Another way of summarizing this vision is the cheap revolution. 
This was a phrase that was invented by the editor of Forbes almost seven years ago to describe the development of technologies that give people ready access to all the computer tools they need, the hardware and the software, at a price that's five or ten times cheaper than in the past. Because of this cheap revolution, the internet startups that are beginning today can get started for a million dollars, maybe two million dollars. In contrast to the height of the internet boom, the dot-com boom, ten years ago, it typically cost about $20 million to get started. But the cost of the technology is so much cheaper, the internet makes it so much easier to reach your customers and to get the tools you need. We really have seen this profound change in how computing is done. A big part of that revolution, the cheap revolution, is because of the cloud. The cloud is kind of a fuzzy term. And we've had lots of terms that try to describe what the cloud is. The cloud is really a different way of doing computing. It's taking your needs, your computing needs, and not turning to the team inside your company or your organization to do the computing, but going to a third party, to another provider. In the past, there have been a number of attempts to do this, various different names like application service provider, distributed computing, utility computing. They didn't really work because they weren't as reliable as the cloud is today. But the cloud is, is gaining traction. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. They even made a, a portrait of the cloud, you can see here. Um, there, there's a lot of disagreement about exactly what is the cloud and is not the cloud, but we can define it by what it does. Some of the first cloud opportunities were in academia. Research, uh, researchers took dozens, even hundreds of different computers, linked them all together over the network, and they used that combination of machines as one giant virtual supercomputer. And by doing that, they could provide more power to more people to do more research more quickly and more cheaply. And that really laid the foundation. That demonstrated the power of this kind of combined computing. Amazon and Google and Microsoft are now at the leading edge in the development of cloud computing. <clears throat> They're building these massive data centers with hundreds of thousands of computers all linked together, all working as a giant distributed supercomputer. Dozens of these different data centers in different locations, all providing computing services to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at once. One of the most successful cloud services is called the Elastic Compute Cloud from Amazon. Most of you are using this every day without knowing about it. Because many of the startup companies that are running websites now aren't building their own systems. They're not buying big buildings and putting lots of computers in there. They just rent the computing power they need from Amazon. And Amazon will give you, will sell you, rent you the power you need. The computing power, the software, the storage, the networking. You give them a credit card, you tell them how much you need, and, and you get what you want. And what's neat about that is that you can scale up. You can expand your operations just like that. So a company that suddenly discovers it has 100,000 customers when it was expecting 5,000 customers can buy 20 times more computing power just by telling Amazon that's what it wants, or Microsoft, or Google. Anyone in the room who uses Gmail is using cloud computing. Your email is not on your computer. It's sitting in a Google data center. Lots of different services for different applications. One of the early pioneers was salesforce.com. They allow companies to manage all of the um, sales leads that their sales force has. So, and what, uh, what's really magic about that is no matter where the salesperson is, they can log on to the net and they can report about a contact they had with a prospective customer. They can compare notes that they, with some other salesperson they can keep track of all the potential business that they're generating. 
Another really interesting example, the last one on here is called BOINC, the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Networked Computing. You could be part of the cloud. You can take the extra capacity on your own computer and plug it into the BOINC cloud and start, start solving research problems. My laptop, whenever it's on, is helping cure anthrax by doing molecular modeling in its spare time using the excess capacity to help find if there's a drug that can cure anthrax. This is a great site from Akamai. Akamai is part of a data cloud. They store web pages all around the world to give people easier access to the information they want. And what's important about this figure is that up in the top right corner, it indicates that 2.8 million people are visiting the Akamai cloud every second. And 35, almost 35 million people are visiting the cloud and downloading data every minute. So this huge distributed system, thousands of different storage systems all around the world, all connected together. This is the required reading if, if you really want to understand the cloud. This is from The Economist magazine from uh, October of 2008, and it's called Let IT Rise. It's all about the cloud, and it's demonstrating what happens uh, in all different sectors, from business to healthcare, to government, education, and how they're using cloud services to better provide the capacity that companies need. Really is uh, the best article, I've, a series of articles I've seen on the topic in non-technical language. Fourth word, game changer. This is a very big deal. This isn't just a nice thing. This is changing fundamentally the way we do computing. This is the third phase of the internet. It's also the third phase of computing. Let me describe that in what I, I, I like to use what I call CEO pictures. This is for the non-technical CEO. The first phase of internet computing was all about communicating, just email. The second phase was about content, like web. And the third phase is about tying people and content together to provide new ways of collaborating. There's another great book to read about this, this transformation. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought I, I hear it coming back so loud, I didn't think it was coming through very well. There's another book called The Big Switch. This is by Nicholas Carr. And he looks at what happened with electric utilities 100 years ago. 100 years ago in America, if you were a factory owner, you had a vice president for electricity. That person was in charge of running the generators that provided the electricity that ran your machinery. You often needed a team of people to support that. And then the electric utilities came in and provided a cheaper, faster, more reliable way to get the electricity you needed, and you could throw away the generators. The same thing is starting to happen with, with uh, computing, where <clears throat> these big companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, are providing these utility computing services. And the economics are the same. This is a big deal. It's as big as e-business. It's as big as e-commerce. I would like to argue it's as big as the web. Fifth word, many to many. The first phase of the internet was all about, the first phase of computing was all about your computer sitting there on your desk. You had everything you needed. You had your data. You had your application software. You had your computing power. That's what you did. Then you plugged into the web, and that was the next phase. Just a little bit of software, the browser software, gave you access to the whole wide world of data. Millions of websites. Changed everything. In the middle of the 1990s, from 1994 to 1996, the amount of traffic on the internet increased 10 times every year for two years. Hundredfold in two years. Because suddenly everybody was pulling down data from the net. The cloud is this next phase. In this phase, 
Everything lives in the cloud on someone else's computer. You don't need any software or any data on your own machine because you can just tap into the data and the application software that resides elsewhere. And what's really important about this is that the data and the application can be combined in new and different ways. The lines that connect the circles is what's really important here. I can take data from one company, combine it with software from another company, store it on a third company's machines, and I can make a new service for me and my customers that meets my unique needs, and I can do it in minutes. Sixth word, things, as in the Internet of Things. It's not just about computers and people anymore. It's about 100 billion devices. Today, about one and a half million PCs and a few hundred million smartphones plug into the Internet. In just a few years, 50 times more devices. These are going to be sensors, appliances, cars, unleashing incredible new opportunities for monitoring environmental problems, for health. In the latest issue of The Economist, there's a great article about how your carpet may help diagnose a health problem that grandpa has. Because grandpa will walk across the carpet and if he starts to stumble or isn't walking in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in the way he normally does, your carpet will call the doctor. In this world, very simple devices, like my camera, will just plug into the cloud. I won't need to store any data on my camera, I'll just automatically store it in the cloud. The light bulbs in this room will probably be connected to the cloud, so we'll be able to monitor which light bulbs are out, whether they're on when they don't need to be. Sprinklers in my yard, I'll have moisture sensors in my yard to tell the sprinklers when to go on. Even my dog is going to be hooked into the cloud. You can already buy a dog collar that has a GPS receiver on one side and a Wi-Fi connection on the other for only about 50 bucks. And all the computing gets done in the cloud. This is transformational. My former employer, IBM, likes to talk about the smarter planet. I like to talk about fairy tales. When I read my daughter fairy tales, everything was magical. You know, the trees had would, would, could communicate, and the animals could communicate, and the rocks could communicate. That's kind of where we're going. If you go to the Black Forest in Germany, you have wired trees, thousands of trees that are reporting on their stress level. Ecologists, foresters are able to monitor the moisture of the soil, the effect of pollution, by using these very simple devices and plugging into the cloud. This is going to generate a huge increase in the amount of data. And that's going to lead to the exaflood. This is a phrase that George Gilder came up with to describe this huge increase in the number of data, amount of data that will be available on the internet in the coming months. Uh, a, um, we all know what a megabit is, a megabyte is, and a gigabyte. If you take a billion gigabytes, you get an exabyte. That gives you a sense of how big this is. It's tens of thousands of times the amount of data in the entire library of Congress in the U.S., which is the largest library in the world. This chart shows how fast the amount of data on the Internet is going to increase over the next five years. This is a a huge estimate, I mean, lots of uncertainty here, but we're going to see a tenfold increase in less than five years because of all these new devices, all this video traffic, all these new ways of doing things. This is their estimate of where these bytes are going to come from. Uh, some of it will be from video, some of it teleconferencing, some of it from cloud computing. But the impressive thing here is that we are seeing another dramatic jump like we saw with the web 15 years ago. And new applications will be a result of that. That leads to my eighth word, 
Collaboration. How can people work together in cyberspace to make sense of all this data and to be more efficient in the, in the workplace? Social media, of course, is one of the leading edge applications that are enabling new types of collaboration. For a lot of people in their teenage years, Twitter and Facebook are actually replacing email. They just send messages through social media and through, through chat. It's spurring in, uh, innovation. It's allowing crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is when you get thousands of people to help you sort through data, help you find the information you need. That's really a big part of this. There's a great example that comes out of the intelligence community where they took pictures of North Korea. North Korea is one of the most obscure places in the country, in the world, because we can't send people there and take pictures. But they have satellite photos. And using these satellite photos and posting them on the net, they were able to start identifying individual buildings and roads and uh, facilities by asking people, refugees who had fled North Korea or visitors who had gone there, in some cases 10 years ago, what these different buildings were. At this point, about 10,000 people have contributed to this project, and laboriously going through their, 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 their memories and providing annotations to figure out what's going on in North Korea. Really interesting. In one case, a Bulgarian violin student was in North Korea 25 years ago. And he was able to identify more than 500 different places that he visited. In some cases, he still had the snapshots. North Korea is not a very dynamic place. It's not like Doha. So things don't change very fast. The culture minister was still in the same place, and the stadium was still in the same place, and the schools were staying in the same place. But that's how we're going to make sense of this flood of data. In the last 20 years, we've gone from having a scarcity of data to having an overwhelming amount of data. We've gone from struggling to find the data to trying to make sense of the data. And that's where crowdsourcing comes in. This is a big deal. The reason President Obama is in the White House is because of these technologies and because of the cloud. There's a, a wonderful article that ran in Technology Review, which is from MIT. It came out in late 2008. And it's called, How He Really Did It, the web strategy that took an obscure senator to the doors of the White House. They talk about how they, the campaign used social media to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to get them involved in the campaign and to get millions of people to give money, often $20, $50 at a time. The real secret, though, was that they, they worked with the cloud. <clears throat> Rather than giving all their volunteers laptops and installing software on the laptop, they told all the people who wanted to help the campaign, here's your password, get on the web, go to this website. And once they logged on, they could be part of the campaign. They could contribute, they could organize events, they could, keep, they could get the information they needed to effectively campaign for Barack Obama. Obama's real secret, though, was <clears throat> changing the organization so he could take advantage of it. This really is the contrast between the McCain campaign on the left and the Obama campaign on the, on the right. McCain learned how to manage as a naval officer in the late 60s, early 70s. And in that world, the information flows up the hierarchy and the orders come down. So the thin arrows are in indication of the orders, the very small amount of information that kind of trickles down from the top. And anybody in that kind of organization has to make sure that their boss's boss knows what they're doing before they do it. Obama learned to do things in Chicago as a community organizer, where he had hundreds of volunteers, mostly unpaid, and he had to motivate them. He had to get them involved. That's the model he used for management, and it was the, exactly the right model to use for social media and the cloud. Because in that model, you want to flood everyone in the organization with information. You want to be sharing information. You want to be coordinating. When somebody over in Utah has a good idea, you want to be able to share that with New Hampshire. That's the secret of that campaign. The other secret, of course, was he had a lot more people involved because it was so much easier to get people engaged. That's what the dots on the far right are. 
Okay, ninth word, consumerization. This is the trend we see now where people are bringing into the workplace incredibly sophisticated tools and software applications that they use at home or they use in their spare time. Doug Neal, who is with uh, the comp company CSC, defined this term and has written a couple of very good reports on this, on this phenomenon. And it's driving development of these tools in many workplaces and in many governments. Employees are demanding that they be able to use Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Google applications in the workplace because that's what they want to use and that's the best way they can get their job done. This is driving chief information officers crazy, but the smart ones are encouraging this trend and allowing these tools to come into the workplace so that employees can work together with each other, work together with customers, work together um, with governments and partners all around the world. The other reason this is happening is because we're all starting to blend work and home. A lot of us have kids <clears throat> trying to balance work schedule and, and family schedule is not always easy. With the cloud and with these applications, I can work from anywhere. And that gives me the flexibility to be with my daughter when I need to be and do my work. The other big reason this is such an important trend is because it's giving people access to these more reliable, cheaper tools, which can work better than the software that companies and governments have installed for their employees to use. Tenth word is predictions. And I'm going to give you a few more factoids here. In the States, we talk about big, hairy, audacious predictions. And this is a very big, hairy prediction. Within five years, 80% of all computing and storage done worldwide could happen in the cloud. 80%. Storage, computing, I will, however, correct that and say it'll probably take 10 years. The technology is here, and the economic drivers are here. But it probably will take a little longer. But that's still a tectonic shift, completely different way of doing computing in all different aspects of our life. The second big, hairy, audacious prediction is that within five years, we will have 100 billion devices connected. Each of us will have 50 or 100 things in our life that somehow connect to the net and to the cloud. Except that will probably take 10 years as well. So this is my not quite so audacious, not quite so hairy prediction. But that still is a factor of 50 increase in the number of things that are connected to the net. Why is it going to take a little longer? Well, first off, there are technical issues. We have to develop the standards and get them adopted. In most of these cases, we have all the standards we need. We just have to get people to use them. Second thing we need to do is to get companies to work together, because the cloud is all about collaboration. It's about combining things. We also have to change the culture. And this is perhaps the hardest thing. We have to convince customers and companies and CEOs that it's OK to trust Amazon or Microsoft with their data and with the critical functions they need. And the last issue is policy, which leads to my 11th word. Um, I spent 10 years in government, and at IBM I spent a lot of time working with governments, helping them shape policy. And I understand that policy is often the rate-limiting step. It's the last arrow. Often policy is 15, 20 years behind the technology. And if that policy isn't well designed, it can hold everything back. So governments have a critically important role to play, and I'm very glad that Qatar and the Qatari government is focused on this and understands their important role. Their first step is to figure out how to be an early adopter. How can they take these technologies and put it to use, whether it's cloud computing, sensors, social media, virtual worlds. To do that, they're often going to have to change the way they buy computing, how they manage computing. 
They have to make sure they get on board with the right standards. They have to provide secure environments. That's often one of our biggest challenges. Computer in your own house that the police will need a search warrant before they can go in and take that data and look at it. Well, what if you take that same data and you upload it to a cloud and now it's stored on someone else's server? Is that protected as well? That's not clear. But there's a coalition of governments, a coalition of uh, advocacy groups, privacy advocates, and, and companies that have come together to define what the right way to approach that question should be. Because we do have to have clear regulations about stored data and the privacy of that data. We also have to develop ways of showing the customer that the cloud is working the way they think it is. So transparency is as important as privacy in this new world. And as companies offer cloud services, they have to be able to show how the system works, how the data is secured, where your data lives, where it's being uh, moved to, and, and who has access to it. Another really big issue, one that I care passionately about, is online copyright. Uh, two days ago, we celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Statute of Anne, which was the very first copyright law from, uh, from, the, from, uh, from Great Britain. Things have evolved in that time. Copyright law has certainly changed. But we need to adopt copyright to this new world. And there are some people who want to impose stricter and stricter controls and more and more protection for copyright. And that kind of collides with the cloud, which is designed to share information. And so we have this critical, critical point now in, in deciding how it is we're going to protect copyright and what are the new rules in the cloud. Equally important is liability. If I buy service from a cloud provider and they're providing my web services and they're storing my data, what happens if the system crashes and my data is lost? What happens if someone uses a cloud service and does something illegal? Who's responsible for that? And what happens when the cloud servers are in one country, the customer is in a second country, and they do something illegal that affects somebody in a third country. It gets very complicated very quickly. And the last issue on this chart is competition policy. How can governments make sure that there's real competition between different players in the development of, of the cloud? And I'll, I'll finish with three scenarios. Each of these are possible. The people in this room can help shape these scenarios and decide which one becomes reality. The first one I call the clouds scenario. And in this world, we end up with different companies running different clouds, each one using their own technology, <clears throat> very carefully designed so it doesn't work together. Non-interoperable. So you can't move data from one part of the cloud run by one company to another cloud. This is a little bit like the cable television network today. You have one network, they control the content, that's all you got. In this world, there are lots of bottlenecks, there are constraints on innovation, lots of monopolies, and lots of high prices. A better scenario is what I call the cloudy skies scenario. You still have different companies running different technologies, but at least they've agreed upon some ways to translate data from one place to another. It may not be easy, but at least you can move back and forth. You can shift software from one place to another. It's not perfect, it's not flexible, but at least you have a little bit of communication. But the real opportunity is the cloud of clouds. I call this the blue skies scenario. It's where you have thousands of different clouds run by thousands of different organizations, all using common standards that can tie the whole thing together. This is what we did for the internet. The internet is a network of networks all running a common standards. We demanded that. We told the network providers, we want one network running one technology. We want it all to work. We did that back in the 80s. In 1985, there were about eight or 10 different companies all running different network technologies that didn't work together. The internet came along, 
and that became the lingua franca. It became the universal language that linked all these different networks together. Ten years later, the web was created, and again, we had some people who wanted to build their own special version of the web that didn't work with every website or with other web browsers. And we, the community, said, no. We want one web, we want one web browser, we want one standard, and we push the technology in that direction. We're at the same point now with the cloud. And if we don't demand interoperability, if we don't demand flexibility, we're not going to get the blue sky scenario. And we're going to miss out on 50% or 80% or 90% of the opportunities, and it's going to be much harder to use the system, it's going to be much more expensive. And that leads me to my last slide. Just to come back to my earlier factoid, we are less than 15% of the way through this incredible change. The technology is still developing, we're still figuring out ways to use it. This is not a small change. This is incredibly disruptive. We've all heard the cliche that the internet is as disruptive as the printing press. But think about what that means. The printing press enabled Martin Luther to trigger the Reformation. The Reformation caused the Thirty Years' War, which redrew the map of Europe, completely changed the political environment. The printing press enabled large democracies and mass literacy. No one had a newspaper before there were printing presses. The printing press enabled large corporations. All of that was possible because the printing press cut the cost of sharing information by 99%. Before Gutenberg, it took some poor monk a whole year to hand copy a book. Gutenberg could make the same book in about three days. Well, the internet has already cut the cost of sharing information by 99.9%. And all the estimates indicate that we're going to do that, we're going to have another 99% reduction in the coming years, and we're going to use the cloud to provide more tools to make sense of all that information, to make sense of the exaflood. So profound things are happening here, and we're just getting a sense of where it's going to go. Last point. And this is my most important bumper sticker or slogan. When in doubt, empower the user. Look at ways to give users more choices, give them more opportunities to build new things, to innovate in new ways. That's been the success story behind the Internet for 20 years. And if we do it right with the cloud and the Internet of Things, we'll have the same opportunity. And I hope you'll all be part of that. I hope this talk has been helpful in explaining what's coming so you can help your organizations get excited about this and move forward. I do think we're going to have some incredible changes. There are going to be jobs lost, many more jobs created. There are going to be political consequences, economic consequences, cultural consequences. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be in this field. And I'm so glad you're all here tonight. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have about what's coming, what's next, and what the impact of the next generation of the Internet will be. Thank you very much. We're going to have people in the audience with microphones, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Don't grab the person with the microphone. And first, I want to also thank Michael for your presentation. And um, as uh, the policymakers here in Qatar, um, I think some of that made us a little bit nervous. <laughs> However, I, everyone in the room should be very happy to know that Michael will be meeting with a lot of people from ICT Qatar tomorrow, so he can help, help us in setting a policy for Qatar that meets the blue sky scenario that you want. So questions, please raise your hand. Where's the microphones? Um, why don't we start right up front with you? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mahendra Shah from the Qatar National Food Security Program. Thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. My, I want to pick your last 
words, empower the user. So what is the future of internet in a world that is global? 75% of the world does not have access to internet. We talk about internet access being a universal human right. Governments, and I think we have a responsibility, you gave an example of North Korea. You know, the same example can be put on environment, on climate change, on degradation. And those are the issues where we have the knowledge. We do not have the commitment. We do not have the vision. We put in actions without the vision. And I think this is where we need the lead nations. The lead nations who have... Could you ask a question? So what can you recommend in this global sense? Well, one of the organizations I work with very closely is the Internet Society. It's a group of about 50,000 Internet professionals all around the world, more than 100 different countries, all trying to grow the Internet. Our motto, our vision, is the Internet is for everyone. And part of our goal is to uh, ensure that there's a regulatory environment that fosters investment and competition. In too many countries, you still have only one company allowed to provide service. And yet, we have all these new ways of providing Internet service, like wireless, broadband, and the like, that can decrease the cost of connection by 10, 20, even 50 times. So the opportunities there for those countries that open up their marketplace and invite in these new technologies. We're doing a conference in Washington on the 29th called Connecting the, uh, the Next Billion Users. And we're looking both in the United States at the most remote areas that are unconnected and at developing countries around the world to see what's being done. Because it's not just about the connection, it's also about giving people the content that makes it worth their, their effort and their investment. And it's about giving them the confidence to use the system, that it's reliable, that it's trusted, that, that they know how to use it. So that's, that's the, 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 the puzzle here, connection, confidence, content. Um, the good news is most countries ha have a vision now for the internet, and they've embraced it. We've seen what's happened in China in the last five years. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. The number of people using the Internet in China now exceeds that in the United States. And in another year, it will exceed the number of people in Europe who are online. And many of those people aren't just using small, sl slow dial-up speeds. They're using broadband or they're using high-speed wireless connections. So I think we're moving pretty fast in the development of the the network itself, the, ne the next question is making it more useful to more people and making it more affordable. There, there's, there's still, there are still countries where the phone company or the internet provider seems to focus on the richest 3% of the population and prices accordingly rather than trying to meet the needs of everyone. But that's, that's the first question we should always ask is how do we make this global? How do we meet the needs of everyone? I think we have a... Sure. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask about um, some of these international security concerns. I'm a Canadian. Our databases have often been in the U.S. And suddenly with the Patriot Act coming out in the U.S., they were uh, potentially subject to U.S. government surveillance without our even knowing about it. And I'm concerned about some of the implications uh, especially as, as this cloud goes up. If the cloud is all in the U.S., then maybe we know what's happening. But if part of the cloud is in North Korea, are we going to be happy with using that? Or yeah. what do you see happening there? This is a, another fundamental issue. It's one that um, needs to be resolved, I think, by ensuring that these companies are providing a global infrastructure. And in some cases, it may be that there's a European cloud and a Canadian cloud and for certain types of data the data will live in that part of the cloud and it will not be shared widely. But these rules are very inconsistent and we don't have any real model of what the global cloud will be like and how privacy will be protected and there's a need for coordination across companies and across nations. I think in the end, it's going to be the companies that set the, the rules. And they're going to compete with each other 
to make sure they have clear rules that customers can understand and they're going to pressure the governments to make sure there's no um, confusion about how the data is protected. As we know, Google just recently pulled out of, of China and the primary reason they did that was because the Chinese were sponsoring hackers to attack Google's own systems and to gain access to the Google Cloud. And Google said that's completely unaccept unacceptable. Google decided they could not protect the privacy of their customers when the Chinese government was hacking into this, the Google, Google network. And so that, that is, I think, a, just a one skirmish in what's going to be a very interesting battle going forward. I, I was going to go back to your question real quickly and invite people to join us on April 23rd. We're having a, a Twitter jam. The, uh, the Internet Society of DC, which I'm, I'm in part of the leadership for uh, Internet Society DC, is having a uh, one hour long conversation, a chat on Twitter. It'll be at uh, 10 o'clock p.m. Qatar time on Thursday, the 23rd. <clears throat> and we're going to have experts from all around the world talking about ways to connect the rest of the world. So if you look for the hashtag, if you just hash ISOCDC, uh, you'll find that we're, we're having a very lively conversation. And this week on Thursday, we're having one on Collaboration 2020. Same time, 10 o'clock on Thursday evening, uh, same hashtag. Uh, this is part of a conference we're doing at, at Georgetown on the crowd and the cloud, innovation in cyberspace. And again, we'll have experts in, in, innova in collaboration technology from many different countries as part of that. And we'll try to put that on the ICT Qatar website so you can get the information on that as well. Other questions? Well, I'll go to right here, this gentleman in the front. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor. So uh, you mentioned you referred only to three landmark incidents in the states elect, uh, electing President Obama, Star Wars, but you shrugged off two important <coughs> incidents. The first in Iran, empowered by Twitter. The second in Egypt, mm -hmm. when 6 April movement were totally crushed by the Egyptian forces from two or three days. My question now, in the future, do you expect that internet will change corrupted and totalitarian regimes in democratic and transparent? Thank you. This is part of the reason I'm confident that we're only 15% of the way through the internet revolution. Because we're still finding ways to force change and use these tools to, to change the, the, the environment, the, the political environment. Iran is a fascinating example. And, and people think that, well, you know, the Twitter revolution in Iran failed because the regime is still there. But it hasn't failed. The, the people who were using Twitter managed to get their message out to the world just as the monks in, in Burma were able to put out the YouTube videos. They've used this technology very effectively to change the whole global perception of the regime. And I think we're also starting to see local organizing. That, that's actually probably going to be the more interesting and effective use of this technology. We tend to look at these situations and say, oh, well, it's a, you know, it's a global media market. It's all about putting out YouTube videos on, 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 on the, in the media. No, often it's about doing things at the local level and changing the local politics and building up from there. That's what's happening in China. Again, we tend to focus on what the national government's doing, but at the local level, local bloggers, people using Twitter and chat are able to highlight the actions of corrupt officials in some cases, they're able to get them thrown out of office. They're actually starting from the bottom up. And I think that's how we need to think about this. It's, it's really going to happen 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people at a time. It's not going to be a revolution that starts from the top. And in 15, 20 years, or maybe even 10 years, I'm going to come back here. and We're going to have a great discussion about what's happened. Because we are going to see more change. In the next 10 years, we're going to see more political change than we've seen in 50 years. There's a great new book out called Rebooting America. 
and I urge you all to read this if you want to understand the impact. It has, actually has authors from all around the world, from Canada, from Europe, Middle East, but they're all looking at how politics are changing. It was written right before the election, so a lot of the focus was on what was happening in elections. But we're also talking about some fundamental changes in how government services are provided, in how democracy works, in how governments consult with their citizens. And, and that's exciting. I mean, that's really exciting. That's one of the things I'm spending a lot of time on. Great question. So let me go over right there in the green tie. Yes, yeah, standing up. I'm going to give shorter answers. I keep seeing more and more people putting their hands up. Hello, my name is P.U. Shagrawal, and I'm, I think, coming down from the national issues to, you know, more at the organization level. As uh, we saw the emergence of uh, IT in the companies, you see what happened, there was a period where IT had tremendous power. And now if we are going to, you know, talk about this cloud computing where all that power center which IT is today is going to move somewhere in the cloud. So do you see a demise of the IT departments in the companies and the shifting of, you know, jobs from out uh, from that position? Yeah. Well, this is the third point on my list of, of, of barriers. As you recall, I had technical barriers, business practices, and culture. There are a lot of chief information officers who think that in the world of the cloud, CIO will now mean career is over. <laughs> because Amazon and Microsoft will be running all the computers that the company needs. That is a concern only if you realize, if you, if you do not realize that in the world of the cloud, your employees are going to have all these new things they're going to want help with. So the smart CIOs are the ones who are moving to the cloud as fast as they possibly can and then finding ways that they can help the employees use the new tools that the cloud provides. At Georgetown University, we decided we didn't need to be in the business of running email systems. When I first arrived at Georgetown two and a half years ago, all the freshmen would come, and they, they had just come out of high school, they showed up at Georgetown, and they got their brand new georgetown.edu email address, and they were given their email account and they were told they had 25 megabytes of storage. And their response, two questions. One, what do I do after the first week? <laughs> and the second question was, how do I forward my email to my Gmail account? And we decided that was a good model for us, so we hired Google to run all of our email for all of our students. But that doesn't mean the CIO's job goes away. The CIO still has to know how to use the cloud. It has to develop the new tools to use in the cloud. It's just a totally different job. It means a lot of retraining, though, and it is, it is a big challenge. And, and, and we do see in many companies the CIO first reaction, oh, no, can't do the cloud. That, that, that's a different. That's, not, that's no good. The good news is that in many companies the chief financial officer looks at the numbers and says, we can do computing for 20% the cost that we're spending now. And the CFO is usually more powerful than the CIO. And the CFO makes a good argument to the CEO who tells the CEO that they're moving to the cloud. I'm Steve from PJ Media, who are my friends from Vodafone and I love Qatar. Um, I'd love to hear more of a direct vision of your steer. Let's presume you were e-president-elect three months' time. What would be your top three manifesto? Only three. <laughs> I think the first thing I would do as a, as a government is to make more content available. And this is something that the Obama administration, a number of other governments around the world have realized. Governments sit on an incredible amount of information both economic data and educational information, uh, information about how to do things, travel information. So I think that's the first step, is make more services available. <clears throat> in, uh, in Washington, D.C., which for many years was one of the most incompetently run city governments in America, 
the CIO a couple of years ago helped reinvent the city government. And what he did was he took all the data that they had, crime statistics, bus schedules, uh, information on traffic, and he made it all available online in an easy to use format and challenged people to come and find ways to use the data. So that's an example. It's called uh, Apps for Democracy. The second thing I think is really important here is to push for the open standards and open technologies. Push for the blue sky scenario. Make sure the pieces fit together. In most countries, the government is the largest purchaser of information and communication services, so they can influence the market and push the market to openness, making sure the pieces of the cloud fit together. And the last thing is in the area of security. Um, governments have a lot of, of interest in providing for secure communications and making sure that the cloud is secure. I think they can drive research in the area of computer security and network security, and they can also be a, a very smart purchaser of secure services and, and, and help force that. One thing we did in the States was um, pass laws that said if data was lost on the Internet, then the company who lost the data had to notify the owners of the data that their credit card number or other personal information may have been compromised. That was an incredibly important step in providing more transparency and it also motivated companies to do a better job of protecting their data. So that's an example of how you can push for better security. But that would be the first three things on my list. I've got, a, I've got another hour-long lecture I can give to answer your question in more detail. Okay? Other questions in the back? Uh, hi, I am from Cornell Medical College, and um, considering the, uh, the research data or sensitive data that turns into value of intellectual property and the way we um, can utilize uh, the cloud computing uh, versus cloud computing for collaboration, uh, common information, and um, just generic issues. Now, is there going to be kind of international legalization or law that charges or accuse whomever tends to leak information or tends of uh, steal information of such related sensitive data mm -hmm. worldwide that can charge them or bring them to court or something like that? Well, I think there, there's two questions there. One is the question of online copyright and how will we protect copyrighted content in the world of the cloud. I personally think that copyrighted content is going to be much less important in the future. It's already less important. People are spending more and more of their time reading what their friends and neighbors and colleagues write on Facebook, which is, which is copyrighted but not protected than they are watching television. And we're sharing all this content on YouTube that is made available for free. So I do think there's going to be a shift away from copyrighted material. There'll always be copyrighted content, but we won't spend all of our time watching it. I also think a lot of people are starting to realize there's a lot of benefit in giving away content, even if it is copyrighted, and sharing it in ways that stimulate other new business opportunities. So the rock bands in the United States give away their music and sell the t-shirt and sell the concert ticket. That's, uh, but the other question you have is about confidentiality and protecting the material. I actually think the cloud will be more secure than the systems we have today. That doesn't sound logical. How can that be logical if the same data is going to be in the cloud and it might be stored in five different places? You know, isn't that going to be less secure? And the answer is no, if the cloud is designed properly. And the cloud is being designed by the best engineers in the world. Very highly paid, very well compensated engineers who are going to build a much better system than the information technology team at some small company that isn't in the high tech sector and doesn't pay its staff very well. So I think we have a chance to move to a, a better system 
with built-in protections, layers of protection that will actually give us more confidence that our data is being treated the way it needs to be. But essential question, I'm glad you asked that. But as you said at the beginning that technology uh, is moving please, faster it's, it's, than we expect. So what if in five years from now, somebody come with uh, another idea which makes cloud computing something old? What if this scenario happens and what do you think that new, that te new technology uh, would be? I've it's speculated about this a lot, and um, I, I, tend to look, I tend to look at um, the big trends. And I, 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 I had the slide that showed communication one way, content one to many, and then collaboration, many to many. I think the next phase is probably community. It's different groups able to have a really strong emotional bond in cyberspace. And we're, we're just starting to see that today. Today, it's still about moving content and information back and forth. But in a few cases, you can actually have an emotional bond, not quite as strong as you do face to face over the dining room table, but you can actually get close enough to somebody to really feel that you know, they're part of your community. And I think that, that could be what the, the next killer application of cyberspace is. Well, I think it would be through, through um, things like virtual worlds. And what, uh, there's a, a term I like called second earth. And this is where not only are you building simulations of a fantasy world, you're, you're taking data from the real world and incorporating it into a simulation, a model, and so you can see the traffic in your city and you can you know, take your cartoon character and walk down the street and see things the way they really are and start interacting with other people and seeing their real face in real time and hearing their voice. That's going to be an amazing new opportunity to sell things, but it's also going to be an amazing new opportunity for education, new government services. It, it's a bit hard to imagine because we don't quite have the technology yet. But if you haven't tried out Second Life and some of the other virtual worlds, it's worth trying that just to see what it's like to go into one of these simulations and to, and to and have a sense that you're in a three-dimensional environment. My, my daughter is 12 years old and she's really into this. It's, really, it's, it's kind of scary how much time she can spend interacting with her friends and building things that don't exist. <laughs> But I, 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 I like your question, and it's something I think a lot about in my class on the future. Thank you very much for so many great questions. Thank you for staying so long. And I, I know Doha has some incredible things to do, and you all came here to listen to me. I'm very flattered and very, very grateful.